Coming up on today's Friday First. We look at what is being done to help the homeless on the streets of Manchester. We're talking Salford Business Awards with 2012 winners Swifty Scooters. And I'm here to bring you the latest in sport. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to Friday First, the programme bringing you the best of Keys news and entertainment from the week. First today, with an ever increasing amount of homeless citizens on our streets, questions are being asked to what is being done to help them. We sent Alex Worthing to find out more. The amount of men, women and children being put out onto the streets is on the rise. Cuts to various government funds means that the number of homeless shelters are in decline not only in Manchester, but across the country. Well, these, these guys need homes. I mean, there's, there's been an increase of 50% in homelessness in the last five years in Manchester. Now, whether that's to do with cuts in, in public funding or whether it's the approach of the way we deal with homelessness that needs to change, that's, that's something that needs to be worked on and, and strategies need to be developed. A scheme set up to help people cover some of the cost of housing, known as DHP, has been cut. In the North West, spending has been reduced 7% from 15.5 million in 2013 to just over 14 million this year. The uh, response in different areas is so different. Like Man Manchester is the worst in, in all over the UK. In Glasgow, you get, you're out for one night, you get to be home the day after. I've heard um, a, a what, guy what? told me to go to Belfast. Yeah. He said if I go to Belfast, I'll spend one night on the streets. Yeah, like the next thing. night, one I'll night be out, given a one, place. One night out only. We approached Manchester City Council for an interview, but they declined to comment. One charity believes that derelict buildings like this one could be converted into shelter at little or no cost to the government, which would see hundreds of people put back into accommodation. Alex Worthing, Keys TV News. The Salford Business Awards are now less than a month away. Applications are now closed and with a selected number of lucky candidates making the final shortlist. Swifty Scooters know exactly what it's like to walk away with the prize after their victory in 2012. They're back this year hoping to scoop another prize in a different category. Rhys Chaplin finds out just what it takes for a business to win at the awards. Swifty Scooters is an innovative business which has reinvented the world of scooters. The business was only founded in 2011 and have already won a category at Salford Business Awards. Yeah, yeah, we, uh, it was really nice. We, we, we uh, entered into the Salford uh, Business Awards in 2012 and we won the category of Rising Star, which is an award for new companies uh, with, a, with, a, with a strong future. So we won that category. It was great. We managed to get on the BBC World Service. We went on Radio 4. It was an amazing award to, to win. With the success of the business growing, Swifty Scooters hope to expand in the near future to benefit the community. One day our aspiration is to build the company to a level whereby I can then build my own factory and employ all the local community to actually build these scooters here in-house. So what does it take for a business to succeed in the awards? Um, well, obviously they've got to be based in Salford. Um, I think they've got to be quite distinctive in terms of what they're offering. Um, generally, we're finding that kind of newer startup businesses have that kind of energy and ideas that make them award winners. Why have Swifty Scooters done so well in these awards? Uh, well, Swifty Scooters is, is a good example, really. I mean, you've got two people there with, with an idea. Um, um, not necessarily a, a brilliant original idea. There's other people who make scooters, but they've obviously worked hard on kind of branding and building the image around their product. And, you know, they've put their life and soul into it and, and probably risked quite a lot of money. Really thought about the marketing and building the whole image around their products and using social media to actually promote their products. And they've got, you know, a really nice, complete package. And, and you know, they seem to be doing very well. What does Soul for Business Awards do for the city? Um, I think Soul for Business Awards are good because they highlight Soul as a key area for business. Puts, puts Soul for on the map. So it's, it's a bit of a publicity thing bring, brings it to everybody's attention. 
I think it brings a bit of prestige to the city and will get um, a lot of small businesses better known. Winning a category at the Salford Business Awards is a prestigious achievement for any company. Swifty Scooters knows just what it feels like to win at this event and hope to continue their success. A brand new £150 million district in the city centre is set to be built. It will include 500 new apartments alongside artisan bars and independent restaurants. The developers plan to reopen Little David Street, which has been closed off for several decades and will create the brand new district. Adam Brady of Henry Boot said, We're not looking to create another Northern Quarter, Spinning Fields, Shoreditch or anywhere else here. Campus will be a distinctive sub-district with its own individual vibe. Now with the election quickly approaching, it's time to talk election. With only six days to go until people take to the ballot box, we had a look at the latest opinion polls to see how the election is shaping up. The Conservatives and Labour have been neck and neck since the beginning of the year. Our reporter, Garana Yelavina, takes a look at the latest figures. In just over a week, people across the country will vote in the closest general election for decades. YouGov conduct polls every day and things are looking close. The two main parties are neck and neck and neither have anything like the share they need to win an outright majority. Labour has taken the lead back from the Tories today and are ahead by one point. When it comes to key issues, people want to hear more about the environment, pensions and education. Most striking of all, the polls show they want to hear more about any subject so long as it's not Scotland. And who seems to be enjoying the campaign the most? 34% thought it was Nicola Sturgeon, while only 7% of people opted for David Cameron, suggesting he's having the least fun. The Cameronettes and Miller fandom have taken Twitter by storm, starting a new online craze, photoshopping the leaders' faces onto celebrities' bodies. James Dean, David Beckham, Superman, we've really seen it all at this stage. But those two are not faring as well in a poll of physical attraction. Nick Clegg has come out on top. He's winning the race by 4.6 out of 10, closely followed by David Cameron and the Labour leader. Nigel Farage, however, has come out last with two points out of 10. Oh dear. So far, every poll indicates that this election will end in a hung parliament. That's where no party wins enough seats to form a majority government. This is being put down to the growing influence of smaller parties such as UKIP, the Greens and SNP amongst voters. We sent John Mitchell to find out more about Manchester's fringe candidates. We celebrate the free movement of people... There's usually an air of familiarity to the political landscape, but this election campaign, the headlines haven't always been grabbed by the same old faces. There are some new kids on the block, and they're making noise. In fact, over 30% of the electorate are expected to vote for parties other than Labour or the Conservatives come May the 7th. But with this third block made of numerous other smaller parties, only really the SNP and Lib Dems have any chance of influencing policy in Westminster as part of a coalition. So why vote for these smaller parties? One of those parties is the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition here in Salford. There's no belief on their part that a vote for them is a vote wasted. It's our party is uh, for all against the cuts because we're, um, I think we're the only party that's standing because uh, austerity has gone too far now and we are fighting the cuts in Salford. The parties are also keen to maintain their own identity and not simply appeal to those looking to protest against the establishment. Emma van Dyke, standing for the Green Party in Salford, hopes that voters will invest in their manifesto. The Greens have a fully comprehensive, fully costed manifesto that covers all the major issues. We do have policy. We're not just a one-trick pony like, like we used to be, probably. The likelihood is that these parties' manifestos will this time round be consigned to history. But as they start their own journey towards Westminster, it's worth remembering that over 100 years ago, history was once kind to a small protest party of its own, the Labour Party. Jonathan Mitchell, Keys TV News. From party politics to football, Joey, what's been happening in the sport? Well, as the non-league season comes to an end, just a few days after FC United won promotion to the Conference North, Salford City lifted the Evo Stick North Trophy. Over a thousand fans took advantage of free entry into Moor Lane to watch an emphatic 5-0 win against Osset Town. 
The pick of the goals was this from Jason Jarrett in his last ever game for the club. The Amis looked out of the title race back in January, but after a change of manager and 17 wins from 19 games, they finished the campaign victorious. I spoke to the club's co-owner Phil Neville after the game and he believes this is just the start for Salford. To get a thousand people in to watch a Salford City game when there was only probably 150 at the start of the season and the celebrations, the people, the kids here, the way that the, the way that the the players are enjoying it, and the management. It's just a wonderful day for Salford City, and it's like we just said to the management now. This is the start of what what we want to build a momentum now, where next year we can. We got a thousand people this year. Can we get to two thousand next year? We want to keep going forward and keep winning things and keep this spirit that that's been generated, because it's definitely the people of Salford now. I think I think they're getting to understand what the, what this club football club's all about. Thanks, Joey. Now, the battle of Britpop in the 90s could be on the verge of a return. After rumours emerged of an Oasis comeback, Rob Hall takes a look at how the Manchester music scene and the city itself has changed since we last heard from the Mancunian Hellraisers. Boddington's Bitter, football and Oasis are some of Manchester's finest commodities. Media City is new. However, what else has changed since Oasis split five years ago? Little has changed at the Gallagher's Burnage family home on Cranwell Drive. Likewise, Fog Lane Park was the original location used for the promotional video for the band's second single, Shaker Maker. Mr Sifter sold the songs when I was just 16, wrote Noel, singing about his local record shop. Yeah, well, they always come back in, in the end, you know, maybe they're at a loose end and bored or something, you know, but I mean, there's always some reason to reform. You forget the differences, that sort of thing. We'll soon remember them again once they've got together, don't they? But, uh... Biscuit Factory is the cornerstone of Burnage. Not wanting a job there was one of the reasons Noel started the band Oasis. One of the more significant changes is the demolition of Manchester City's main road football ground. Its site in the Moss Side location is now being developed into housing. Palace Nightclub in Levenshume used to be frequented by the Gallicas. It's now a restaurant. But how has the music landscape changed since 2009? The, the Manchester scene from the punk period uh, onwards, you know, I think there's endlessly creating generational defining bands. I think Oasis was the last one of those bands. That doesn't mean there's nothing left in Manchester. It's, it's a great diverse musical scene now, but it's a completely different kind of thing now. From vinyl to the iPod, music consumption is constantly changing. Just this week, Instagram launched App Music, a new account dedicated to exploring music around the globe from creators to consumers. With new methods of finding and listening to music constantly popping up, we wanted to find out how each of us consume our music. So, Joey, where are you on music consumption? I'm quite lucky myself. I don't actually have to buy a lot of music because my mum had a brilliant music taste herself, so I've oh. just put all of her CDs so on that's the all iTunes. the Westlife and Boys Own and Blue and, and all that, is it? No, not exactly that. My mum had a good music taste. <laughs> that's it. harsh. Yeah. That's unfair. No, it's more Westlife. your Britpop, Oasis, Blur, James, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. How about you? Yeah. Well, I'm more into the Spotify scene. Like, I just like everything being there on the internet and <laughs> like, just it's just all available to me so I can change whatever I want to listen yeah. to. Like, it's just yeah. easier. No, that's fair, yeah. I'd say I'm more of a CD person, although not everyone is. I actually bought a friend of mine a CD for his birthday a few weeks ago, and he said he had no platform from which to play it. You see, so I didn't. None at all. Yeah, no, and, and then that's in the whole house, him and his parents and everyone, just iPods now. How can you do that? It's only 2015. Although, I've still got my record yeah, player. How can you no, not do He described CDs, CDs as the dark ages. That's more cassettes, really, though, in it, like the whole rewinding situation. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I imagine there are still people who use that. Yeah, do you think? That's very true. Hopefully, not yeah. many then. <laughs> well, we'll see. Right, thanks a lot, Joey. Now, with the weekend upon us, you might be wanting to venture to the outdoors. It might not be the best weekend for that. Saturday will be cloudy with highs of 10 degrees with some chilly winds. Sunday doesn't improve either. A very overcast day with slight glimpses of sun. If you have plans with the family, I suggest resorting to the wet weather alternative. That's all we have time for today. Friday 1st, we'll be back next Friday at 1.30pm. Remember, you can keep up with all the latest news, sports and entertainment on keysnews.net. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.